So welcome, Hui Hua. Lovely to see you here. You've been such a good friend to Forum um, over the past. And your first book, which I think was about 2014, 2015, things go by now, but you spoke mm -hmm. to us in Spencer House, I remember well, in November of 2014 or 15. And uh, that was when I first met you. And thank you so much for that. And you've also spoken for Forum in Singapore as well, where you are currently uh, sitting. Um, so here is the book that about which we're all going to speak. And I hope all of you, and I will remind you at the end, should be buying it. Uh, it's entitled Government in Business, Leading or Lagging. And uh, I guess, Hui Hua, that, um, I mean, obviously, this is a very propitious time for the book to, to be published. And when you started, I presume you had no idea that COVID was about to change the world um, and that governments would suddenly have a, a new role to play. So, you know, you talk about leading or lagging, but I mean, after the last 12 months, we know the answer, don't we? They're, they're leading. I mean, governments worldwide have taken complete control. Well, Simon, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me um, to join this. Um, I had absolutely no idea what the difference COVID would make um, at the point when I wrote the book. And within a matter of one year, I, I witnessed the about turn in public opinion on the role of government in business. Um, if you recall, pre-COVID, it was, it was fashionable to say less government, more business. But now the question is always, why isn't the government taking control uh, from things like over the supply of masks, vaccines or healthcare facilities to mandating lockdown restrictions, which is obviously very detrimental to the economy. And more importantly, to expecting the government to take leadership in efforts to resuscitate the economy, save jobs, rescue businesses, and mount bailouts of national icons. Um, so dip into reserves or take on more national debt if necessary. Yes, absolutely. Well, I'd love to come back to the societal questions, if we may. I mean, I, I you know, when does when does government when does the government when do governments move um, choice back to the people, if you like? And maybe that's a question we'll we'll come on to later. But it, with particular regard to the book, um, you write of government responsibilities in in the steady state, which you put in inverted commas. And I wonder whether that was a post COVID remark. But in the steady state, um, you say governments exist to design and describe the rules of engagement. So post-COVID, I'm interested to find out from you how governments should lead, you know, both in the business sector and societally. But business first, I mean, in particular, the challenges to lead in the field of technology, fintech and AI. I mean, they, governments need to regulate. Um, so firstly, how how do governments lead with the technology sector? You know, here is massive cycle of innovation. Uh, what, how do governments lead in the technology sector? Mm -hmm. um, the steady state actually um, refers to changes that were already taking place regardless of COVID or otherwise. And uh, regulating technology is perhaps the greatest challenge for any government. Uh, we are not short of examples. Look at China and see how Ant Financial has suddenly be, you know, been sort of, um, faulted for failing so badly. Uh, there is also the promise action for some of the other big names. Or in the US, the issue of data privacy with uh, WhatsApp, Facebook. My personal view is that unless absolutely necessary, the government should not lead in technology because I believe that proactive introduction of rules tend to stifle innovation. But that's, to say that, uh, that's not to say that government should not do anything. The government should instead track very carefully and closely with the private sector, perhaps offering the incentive that um, if there is collaboration, there won't be harsh regulations that are sort of introduced belatedly. The other point which I would 
like to make also to the credit of um, the government to some extent uh, is the uneven distribution of talent. Because technology promises productivity and the ability to create new products and services that can exploit lacuna in regulatory frameworks. In other words, beat the system. Uh, and they are very rewarding careers as far as the private sector is con uh, concerned. So it is not surprising that talent will flock to private enterprises more than government. So government will not get its fair share of talent on the front. Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, I must say, when I read your book, I um, was beginning to feel um, concerned and worried for governments because you make that point very stridently. And it, it, the sort of the tortoise and the hare analogy came to mind um, in terms of those uh, the more the more um, uh, the more enigmatic, shall we say choosing choosing a, a career in tech over over that of government but but nevertheless we as citizens we look to government surely for certainty and consistency so the need to regulate the world of technology is important isn't it Would, uh, you say you know you you mentioned there just drawing back a little from it and not stifling but but how does government deliver certainty and consistency to 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 its people and um, so you know timing is everything and it's extremely difficult uh, because it's not a luxury that any government has it's almost like the backstop to a softball game um, when nothing happens nobody thinks about the backstop but when something happens everybody asks where's the backstop and they expect the government to be there and the government can only be there and attempt to play some role uh, if it has always been around there, you know, keeping track of trends, um, keeping up to speed with uh, all the developments that are happening in the private sector and being a little more careful with areas, especially of overlapping domains. But what about what about the freedom, the data situation, where you know which we're all concerned about as citizens? How how can government possibly regulate that that collection and transferal and use of data, particularly, of course, when um, which is a new phenomenon, which I want to come back to in a moment. But you know, particularly when when these companies are borderless. Yes. Uh, so, so that's a real challenge. Um, it's very evident in the area of fintech, for example, and you have overlapping domains. Um, so, for example, you have ride sharing, which is completely like Uber and, and, and Grab in Singapore here, which is complicated enough without the issues of having to deal with the taxi unions. Uh, but many then go on into food or medicine delivery and then payments and all the online retailing platforms that begin by just providing the platform for you know online sales uh, and now then going into investment advisory or even unsecured lending so they kind of creep into the spaces and at the end of the day it's really a political question uh, in my view because consumers rather enjoy the convenience of a one-stop platform and will therefore oppose any imposition of regulations. But the need for regulation may be made evident or more pronounced when the operator has gained a certain scale uh, to pose systemic problems, such as having too much information or um, having too much uh, or having extended too much unsecured lending. Uh, so again, what's a government to do? It, it really needs to track very, very closely. Um, where it's fintech, then it needs to encourage the use of sandboxes for the various experiments that can go on. Yes, I wanted to come on to that with sandboxes, and I will in just a second, if I may. But I think it's that interesting point, isn't it, where these tech companies reach the scale where they become viable. And at that point, they they it could be argued they're actually a utility and therefore once they're a utility the 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 public as a whole are are using them and at that point it's very difficult for the government retroactively 
to mm. to regulate and to and to use your phrase to stifle that's right and, and data becomes a business for the operator without the consumers sort of really uh, realizing what the implications are uh, so you imagine if the government were to act prematurely too early when you know the operator has like a hundred thousand users uh, it, it will be like a sledgehammer, I mean, onto the situation and you will surely kill off innovation if the government were to do that. Um, so timing it, you know, in terms of what, what's the right scale to start imposing regulations, uh, these are the real challenges that the government of every country um, is actually having to grapple with, uh, including the problem of uh, borderless transactions as well. Yes, absolutely. And, and let's not forget that technology has pretty much saved most of the world uh, in the last 12 months. So, um, so we're, we're, we're grateful in part for that. Um, moving on to fintech, which is obviously a big subject in your book. Um, again, you know, wave after wave of fintech innovation. And just, just expand a little bit there for me. Again, it's cross domain, but you know, where you see governments responding here because this is this is people's money mm -hmm. um, so, so there are many stakeholders here um, if if I were a financial institution that has you know very onerous capital requirements just to provide services in Singapore I will be up jumping like crazy and, and you know um, telling the government hey that's unfair you, you should do something about that. But because of the creeping in nature of how these platforms have gone into, you know, from something seemingly uh, seemingly harmless to something that's clearly financial, uh, we, we uh, the government actually has a really tough job to decide when to impose and what sort of regulations. Um, so I think they have tried doing things like digital banks. And even within digital banks, they, they have the ones that are fully licensed to take deposits and they have ones that purely do wholesale. Um, so I, I think that's about as good a response that one can expect from governments to provide sort of regulated, uh, you know, safe spaces for consumers to think about and to go to. How does government ever keep up? Breathlessly, yeah. Breathlessly, but it can never it can never be ahead of the curve, can it? Because not um, least because a lot of these new companies are operating, as I read in your book, uh, yeah. operate successfully in in what you call the lag in the lag. You know yeah. that there there lies the opportunity, and once the opportunity has been seized, that territory has been seized, and the government then are so the government's always on the back foot. So you, you as, a, as a former mm -hmm. government minister in Singapore and your former colleagues who presumably a number of whom are still still in government. I mean, how and Singapore, we see the rest of the world sees as this as this great sort of um, uh, what should we say, kind of beacon of forward thinking. How, how, are, how are they thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually have lots of examples out of China. Uh, like I say, we've look at Alibaba and financial and so on. Um, it's not from the lack of trying to see how best to regulate the different and the growings of, uh, you know, range of services that N Financial was providing or is providing, uh, you know, leading up to the point when, when they were sort of uh, taken to task. Um, it's, it's always the timing, when, when do you act? When do you decide that regulations uh, need to be imposed and how stiff should those regulations be? Uh, I think every market has its own uh, sort of uh, unique characteristics, which will require a very different answer. And for a market as big as China, obviously when it comes boom, you know, uh, right down there, the, the impact is like really widespread. Um, whereas when it's, um, when it's a smaller country, it's, it's a, a lot more challenging because you, you, you don't want to proactively act to kill off, you know, innovation itself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So can I move you on to um, artificial intelligence now? 
um, because you write in the book, this, this represents a perfect conundrum for governments. Um, so just explain to me and ask a little bit about what your thoughts are there, please. Um, in, in terms of the, sorry. Well, in terms of what I was thinking really about was the, the, the conundrum of how people will react, you know, the new jobs, the, the loss of many existing jobs, and then the question I wanted to come on to was just how government makes sure that with the inevitable rise of artificial intelligence, that the, the, the inequality, if you like, of the haves and the have-nots is not accentuated any further than it needs to be. Right. So um, with artificial intelligence, I, I think you get similar sort of implications and consequences as say those for fintech and technology in general. But in terms of what the implications are for society at large, so um, if we were to just look at valuations that are being ascribed to fintech or, or tech innovation, and we all know that they have rocketed sky high, it filters all the way down the ecosystem. The people who work in such companies are better paid, you can imagine that this will lead to further distortion in the distribution of talent and the consequences would be even more pronounced, uh, you know, inequality, uh, wage divide and so on. Uh, I think for the government of the day, it has to um, ensure that there is a, a fair and equitable system of redistributing the economic benefits, even though it may be founded in just one vertical. And most governments will attempt to do it through taxes, whether it's corporation taxes, individual or, or wealth taxes, uh, but these all have limitations. I mean, uh, you know, because of tax planning and so on. Um, the government also has to ensure that there is sufficient expenditure towards the critical social programs like education, healthcare and housing. Um, it's just become a lot more difficult and challenging because it's no longer a domestic problem. Mm. It's one that is multi-territorial in mm. nature as well, um, which in turn, unfortunately, hinges heavily on the type of politics that we have today. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you for that. And so uh, we're coming towards the end of our 20 minutes, but I've got, I've got a couple more questions if I may, but also those of you who would like to um, ask a question either put up your hand or, um, or, or or put the question in the sidebar and we'll come to that in a minute. But Hui Hua, I just wanted to talk to you about the, the perennial question uh, where Singapore always, in my view, seems to have the right answer. It, it, it's a different, it's a sovereign state. It's a different, it's a different democracy and country to say the UK but it's that ability that Singapore has to plan long term um, and uh, set against, if you like, the short term expedience that that let's say for the argument of the of the uh, the forum membership, many of us in Europe, in the UK and America, you know, the short term expedience of our politicians. How do they ever plan long term? It's. Um... I would say, I mean, speaking as a politician in my previous life, this is really, uh, you know, a, a sort of sad situation. But unfortunately, this is uh, the sort of the realistic or the reality in, in most countries. I mean, politicians these days literally live and die by the ballot box, right? So short termism is unfortunately here to stay. Um, so they will look for low hanging fruits like greater subsidies for public housing, transportation and so on. And the consequence is that no government in the right frame of mind will plan for the longer term, uh, which has huge implications because uh, when we think about how you have growth for the longer term, you're talking about expensive infrastructure, both in terms of economic and social. You're talking about building businesses with sustainability say for climate change, uh, and you're talking about constructing the right regulatory framework for technology, for example. Uh, and a lot of these have, especially for the businesses, they have a long payback period. 
so unless there are incentives in place to induce them to, to make the transition, uh, most of them would not want to. But if the government of the day is not likely to last more than one term, there's very, very little incentive for the government to want to plan anything long term. Uh, unfortunately, that's going to be, I think, the characteristic of uh, growth in most economies. So yes, and you come, you write very interestingly about state-owned enterprises, um, and indeed the fact that they are not the answer to everything in terms of cronyism and corruption and the like. And you you you, you elicit various examples of that, which is very interesting. I just suppose I would. I, the question I just or the point I wanted to make was probably you know what's going on in the U.S. at the moment with um, with the 1.9 trillion stimulus. This, of course, is being positioned as a, a long term move to keep the U.S. economy um, alive and uh, and 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 fruitful. But of course, it's really just a short term measure, isn't it? And suddenly, you know, one point nine trillion. Is that short term thinking or long term thinking? Um, I would say that probably the bulk of it is really to repair rather than to build. Um, I mean, earlier on, you know, in the previous uh, sort of presidency, um, Trump actually proposed, or part of his campaign was actually around sort of updating the crumbling infrastructure all around the country. Um, and infrastructure is such that the longer you, you lay it off, the more expensive and therefore the more impossible it becomes. Um, so you, you almost have to start doing now and you will not be uh, thanked for it you know, for a while because it's going to exact a huge cost, but at the same time, the benefits are not going to be visible. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to come to the questions now. And I see I've got uh, Federica and Daniel Whittakum, both of whom have great experience uh, of China and Southeast Asia. Federica, till recently, was the CEO of SICO in Beijing. So, Federica, can I ask you to, I see you there, yes, can I ask you to unmute and to ask your question of Fihua, please? Uh, yes, good morning and good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you very much for your uh, book and for what you are telling us. Uh, my question is mainly about who is lagging uh, on the government and why. Uh, we probably know the answer, but I would like to, to hear from you, your perspective uh, and uh, some suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, I think a lot of governments are uh, being dragged down by what I call legacy systems. So they've spent lots of money in a, a, a sort of payment system that the banks own. And they are understandably very reluctant to dismantle this when a new payments solutions provider comes along. So it, it tends to go through you know, a period of time where the different stakeholders fight about it, argue about it, and then by which time the government is seen to be lagging because the whole world has moved along. Uh, so like payments in a country like, or in a market like China leapfrogged all the legacy systems that the rest of us had. Um, so they didn't have that problem. And once you start comparing, you will find that legacy systems actually um, tend to be our undoing in many cases. So this goes um, for anything that is related to software for infrastructure, uh, payments, like I say, for financial services. Um, so these are the things that governments, uh, you would do well for governments to pay attention to them and to decide at what point they actually need to make that tough, to take that tough decision and to reform or revamp uh, the entire system. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to come to Daniel Whittakum. So Huihua, Daniel was the former Chief Investment Officer at China Construction Bank. Daniel, your, can you ask your question, please? Yes, hi. Um, good afternoon, Minister Lin. Thank you for such a fascinating talk. Uh, it's very interesting that in China, which has generally had a population very accepting of, um, of privacy uh, oversight by the government or by users, 
in the most recent case, uh, there's been some public concern about um, facial recognition because supermarkets and shops are starting to harvest people's facial details as they come in and out of the shops. And it's a real wild west and people are finally waking up to the fact that facial recognition could be the uh, straw that breaks the camel's back because I, I'm just wondering what your view is on that because our assumption is governments generally are slow but eventually put in the regulations that um, can control the balance within a, within a population in a country. But mm -hmm. facial recognition is going to be and is already such a universal um, application mm -hmm. it seems impossible for governments to control it um, and I just wondered if this might be the moment where governments lose the battle against tech they've been trying very hard to keep up um, I just wanted to see what you thought about that mm -hmm. um, so I um, firstly I think the public is very unpredictable when it comes to views uh, and, and they change, like I say, ever so often. Um, maybe just, uh, I would like to make a reference. You remember the bus incidents in London uh, some years back and how, uh, you know, the, the police was able to track down using all the CCTVs around the streets of London. Um, and overnight, I, I sense that the question about privacy and all that sort of quietened down because people saw the usefulness of having that facility for a good purpose. So I think we will continue to have questions like that. What are the benefits of having something as pervasive as AI, facial recognition, you know, uh, all around us versus uh, the security that it promises if something goes wrong? And I rather suspect that every time you have an incident, the questions will drop off. But over time, the questions about, you know, protecting your own privacy and all that would continue to come up. So that's at the in individual level. Now at the government level, I think um, say in China's case, my understanding is that they will therefore control and track very carefully the companies that are able to provide AI technology. Uh, and, and sort of work closely with them and so on. Um, it's, it's also the, the threat of being heavily regulated if you do not play ball, uh, that I think most of the companies were know, were, were known to be wise about, you know, keeping the government informed about what you intend to do, the applications and so on, so that at the end of it, you minimize uh, any regulatory risk that might come about from a heavy or belated hand. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, I have, there is one more question, if you're happy to take that, uh, sure. Fripa, which will take us just slightly over our time. Fiona, do, would you like me to, I see you're not uh, on screen, would you like me to ask the question or will you ask the question? Go ahead, Simon, you go. Okay, so this is from Fiona Dent and she's saying, do you think it's still possible to have free and fair democratic elections when big technology and algorithmic manipulation have been deployed on a mass scale around the world? The, the answer is I don't know because um, I, I don't want to underestimate the ability of, you know, the combination of algorithms and, and big tech in terms of either influencing or, or changing the, the actuals of uh, voting uh, decisions themselves. Um, ironically, we may all have to return to the cave to cast our vote, just to be sure. But <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't reduce the amount of influence that you know, we get on social media leading up to the day of the election itself. So, so I don't know. Um, I, Hopefully, um, you know, so this would therefore compel governments to think seriously about their own presence on social media uh, in terms of communicating what they are trying to do so that at some point there is a sense, there's a reliable source that people can turn to if they truly want to be comparing all the different options. Yes, absolutely. And I guess, you know, over the next, it's, you know, social media is such a shock to the system, isn't it? 
if you like. And over the next maybe 15, 20 years, people will work out what they believe, what they don't believe, what they what they listen to, what they don't listen to. And maybe, maybe just when it comes to politics and elections, the whole situation will right itself. I, I don't know, but um, who knows? But uh, anyway, we'll leave it. We'll leave it. Uh, we'll leave it in a quandary there. Hui Hua. <laughs> and thank you so much again. I'm just yeah. going to show your book to everybody. Here it is. Here it is. So please order this book. And um, we look forward to particularly, I know you may have plans, Andy hasn't told me this, but you may have plans to be coming to the UK. When you are next in London, let me know and we'll put together um, a, a breakfast and we can talk to you again about the role of government leading or lagging. But for the moment, thank you so much for joining us and have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank, bye you. Bye. Bye thank bye. you. Bye. Bye.